Okay, let's call the meeting to order. Um, additions or deletions from the agenda? Just one update that I'm looking for, and that's um, where are we with the roofs? The roofs, all right. All right. And uh, I want to have a convert. Well, I want to take the mic and have a conversation about Zoom after the math curriculum update. So I'll add that in. So uh, moving on, uh, minutes from uh, May 24th. Any questions, concerns? Uh, if not, uh, make a motion to approve the minutes of May 24th. So moved. It's like Eileen, you're the only second. Uh, second, yes. Sorry, I'm right. still trying to get my sound fixed and set up. But okay. yes, second. You're good. Uh, questions, comments? Favor? Aye. Dean said aye, so no opposed. All right, discussion items. Brian, you're up. All right, uh, superintendent's report for this time. It's the last time we're going to collect this information for you folks so that you can see um, what our month has looked like, or the, I guess the last two weeks. Um, we did have um, a couple, a handful of cases that were handled well, um, again, by our team. Knock on something, we've not had a case in a couple of weeks. And so um, in addition, I did wanna point out that we had a clinic at our school last Friday. We had 35 people who were vaccinated. 20 of them had appointments, 15 were walk-ins, um, five of our students were vaccinated, and the remainder were community members of all ages. Uh, there was a little back and forth um, and a slight amount of confusion getting the message out, and there were some hiccups that were not on our end about posting it to the state website, but overall, we're very happy that we were able to offer it. Um, again, I give all the credit to Louisa Driscoll for her advocacy for this. Um, and so we're really grateful that that took place in our building. Um, we're still holding steady. 83% of our staff are responding to the daily screening that they are fully vaccinated. Once again, we are um, giving a last meals update. I won't be tracking this information for us into next year, um, but the number of meals we served over the past month or so, um, as you can see there in the report, and you can see that to date, we've got a little north of 93,000 meals, breakfast and lunch that have been served. A huge thank you um, to our kitchen staff for all of their tireless work during the pandemic. Um, and of course, a huge thank you to Louisa and her team of nurses for their work during the pandemic. Reigniting education, the four questions that you saw in your um, Report went out to all of our employees last uh, last week. We began looking at them as the leadership team today. They're all free response, so we have some coding to do, but we expect that before the end of the month, we will have coded that um, data set. We didn't get as many as we wanted to respond. Final number responded was 53. Um, out of 181 employees, I was, I'll was i be honest, I was hoping for more, but um, I absolutely understand um, that not everybody responds to those things. We were happy um, that we had that many, and um, now we're going to code all of our responses. As you know, the next step will then be to bring that data to the Reigniting Education team to help us sort that information. And then once they've helped us sort it, we will turn to our families and our community to um, help us prioritize that. So uh, questions on that or questions um, on the next steps of that? What time frames? Could you give us Yeah. So the end of the month, we've given ourselves to the end of the month to code it. Um, and then we will reach out to our reigniting education team. By then we figure we'll be able to meet in person. So we'll find a time to meet in person and we will get um, their feedback to prioritize it. And then as soon as that happens, we're gonna get our survey out to families and community front porch forum uh facebook all those kinds of stuff through the um our power school messaging system so we can hopefully have something by the middle part of the summer is the is the task force still going to include the parents that were on the evaluation absolutely reigniting reigniting team stays the same 
Is it worth putting out a request to see what dates people are available to before summer starts? Because you're going to run into some travel plan issues and you may be able to have people redirect. Uh, we can we can do the best we can with that. And also we'll have a, a call in option available if people are not able to physically come where we recognize we recognize that summer is going to be crazy. We also recognize that this is the timeline we've been given and that, um, you know, the Agency of Education is expecting us to make a good faith effort to engage our stakeholders. And I believe what we are putting forth is going to meet that. Um, and we, you know, remember we also have another bigger pot of money that's coming with Esther 3. So if um, not as many people participated as we wanted the first time for Esther 2, we certainly have another opportunity for folks to participate with Esther 3. Um, so, all right. Um, an I update a, on. I have, I have a comment. Yes, sir. So with reigniting, so, um, you know, I'm going to be as respectful as, as you know, possible. Um, thus far, it hasn't felt like much of a team effort on our end, uh, on, the, on the school board. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, things going on, obviously, with Zoom and just detachment here. But uh, I hope moving forward with live meetings that um, uh, the last sentence of the reigniting education um, would be a true sense that we're all participating, uh, in particular the community, um, and offer uh, some wonderful input uh, that we're, and so we feel that we're, you know, part of uh, what's going on. A thousand percent. I hear you, and I mean that last sentence. Thank you. Okay. Mark. Thank you. Um, I wanted to give everybody an update on the sewer. Um, as you know, on Wednesday, May twenty-sixth, we had some clogs that affected the larger portion of our building um, and it caused us to not be able to utilize all of our bathrooms. So we had to send our students and staff home early. Fortunately, it, uh, we were able to keep our students in the building until noon. So we were able to count that day um, as a day of school. We had um, Wind River Environmental um, helped us out. They came to our building twice. Um, and we're able to diagnose the problem for us. The pipe itself is sagging, um, which is causing a low area that holds liquids and builds up things there. Mm -hmm. um, Patrick helped diagnose and gave me the following bullet points. One, we're eating in classrooms and we put our, we're putting things into our classroom sink drains, which had not typically been there. Since the kitchen has not been operating at full capacity, the staff does not run the dishwasher as regularly, and that helps um, with hot water in the system, keeping <clears throat> grease and debris from building up. Um, and the pipe does have an area that sags, um, and we're gonna need to take that on. Um, so as I mentioned here, we're gonna reconvene the building committee this summer um, to review a proposal to have the pipe cleaned again before school starts. Patrick Campbell does believe that with regular um, upkeep, and um, this repair, this will um, not happen again in the future. Um, and I'll skip ahead to the end, Dean, to address your um, question about the roofs. We're gonna put the roofs and the um, sewer line on the agenda for the building committee. So before the end of this week, I'll be sending out a email um, with a doodle poll to see when people can participate in the next building committee meeting. Um, we, hadn't, we have not moved forward yet on the roofs. Um, so that'll be together with the next building committee. So before we get there, um, just to skip ahead to the building committee, um, is Patrick going to come with quotes or what's the plan? Because, I mean, just talking about whether we need him replaced, we know that. Um, I haven't checked in with him on it. He's been, as you can imagine, straight out. So I will connect with him. And if he has not gotten proposals, I'll ask him to get proposals. Um, and so I won't waste our time if that's not ready. As soon as we're ready with the sewer proposals, we'll have those. If it needs to be two separate meetings, it will be, but hopefully it can be one. And is the sewer pipe within the building or outside of the building? The I don't know the answer. I believe it's within. Jeremy, do you know any more specifics? I think it's within the building. It's inside. It's it, the, the pipe is the one that runs down the main hallway and into the bathrooms that are in the main hall out, across from the cafeteria. It was, the, this section was, according to Patrick, the section was uh, fixed probably about 15 or 16 years ago before he was with us. Um, the, but the work requires removing the floor and the toilets and all that area and then hauling the, the fill out in buckets, repairing the pipe and then bringing it all back in to replace again. So 
it's no easy fix. The, the last time it was done, it was a summer long project that uh, took a lot of work. So the hope is, is that once we get back to sort of a normal school year, that a lot of the, the challenges that we're seeing with the pipe right now would be less of an issue. So, and I go, is this above the main hallway or below the main hallway? Below. So is there a way that we could put a, uh, it's a good question for Patrick, I suppose, but is there a way we could just put a support underneath the sagging line um, and a little bit of that would depend on whether it's PVC or steel? It's, um, it's cast iron. Oh, cast iron. This is like a nightmare that I deal with on a daily basis at the hotel. <laughs> oh my God, what a mess. <laughs> So yeah, okay. I mean, it's it's into the weeds again, but it'd just be nice to be able to put a support under there just to kind of shore things up. I'm not sure if it can be done in a way that doesn't risk cracking the pipe, though. No, you you definitely you cut open the concrete, you uh, fix that area. You don't do supports. You uh, uh, you just you, you should you're gonna dig it up once. You know why not? Yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was do more a little big of an area and switch it to some of it to at least to PVC. Because cast iron, oh my lord, it must be just like a crater surface, like you see on the moon. It just catches everything. Yeah. And uh, every winter, our grease solidifies in our in our line outside from lack of hot water going down. So I can completely relate to all of this. Um, during the building committee, it's, since this was a problem in the past, during the meeting, could we um, possibly be informed of like a history of how many times this has been a problem and kind of what has been done each time? So I do know the last time it happened was before Patrick was hired. Um, so he can bring the information that he's got about it. Um, beyond that, I'll ask him if he has any history prior to him coming on the scene because he noted to me that this was a repair before he uh, did join us. Can you ask her, ask her money for, the, for this fix? Uh, we still, believe it or not, do not have construction guidance from the federal government. Well, well it'll certainly be helpful that he can do, uh, do it right the first time rather than just a localized five-foot area. Of course, it's Agreed. a huge undertaking, but... Well. All right, um, moving on. Although I don't see anybody here from the Qantas Club, we did get an email from um, Morris Shalou indicating that they are prepared to sign the lease that is in your packet. Um, they had to secure some additional insurance, which they have been able to do. Um, we have reviewed this lease with uh, Bernie Lambeck and Mark Avery and the members of the Kiwanis Club. So um, if I hope you've all had a chance to review it. We will need an action item for the board to enter into this lease with the Kiwanis Club, um, and that's included as an action item at the end of the meeting. Um, next on my agenda, uh, let me just pull up my notes from the policy committee. Uh, the policy committee met and went through 10 more policies. Um, I really am going to be very effusive again about their work. Um, Abby Campbell, Lydia Cochran, Kim Cornelius, Louisa Driscoll, Tom Huntington, and Jeremy Ross um, have really helped to move all of this along and have not um, been daunted by the pandemic. So thanks to all of you. Um, I'll very briefly review what the recommendations are and take any questions um, if there are any. We are moving both grade advancement and the homework policy to a procedure. Neither have any status with the Vermont School Boards Association's model policy um, work. What as a quick review for the entire board, there are three policy um, levels, for lack of a better word, from the Vermont School Boards Association. The first is required, the second is recommended, the third is considered. Um, there is um, great, neither great advancement nor homework have any um, status, and so the policy committee agreed to move those to procedures. Um, we have a student drugs and alcohol policy that was reviewed with both Louisa Driscoll and the building principals um, that has been reviewed and is recommended to be adopted to the entire board. There was a code of ethics policy that was for the school board itself. Again, there was nothing in the model policy um, packet that supported that. 
And so I recommended to the committee that it be dropped in deference to the conflict of interest policy that has already been updated since I've joined and began serving here, um, and the committee agreed. Um, the employment of relatives also did not have a status with the model policies that we have, and that's being recommended to be moved to a procedure. Um, prevention of employee harassment is a required policy. It needs to be renamed, um, reviewed by the committee, and adopted. That is a required policy. Selecting library materials is a policy to consider that the committee thought should be moved to a procedure. There's a student enrollment. There was a student enrollment policy on the books in St. Johnsbury that did not have um, a corresponding policy recommendation or status with the school boards association. But what I did find is that it is incredibly helpful, the language there. And so I recommended to the committee that it be moved to the student attendance policy, which is required and um, has been reviewed and recommended to be adopted by the full board, as well as the student freedom of expression policy. Any questions on any of those? Mark, if you're uh, saying something, you're muted right now. <laughs> Your favorite yeah, my, thing to hear? My dog was just no worries. crazy. No worries. So the policies, it seems like now you're at policies that I adopted a couple of years ago uh, when I was on the policy committee. Are we uh, kind of getting towards the point where we don't have to uh, have 10 policies every board meeting to make motions on and adopt? It seems like the only work we do now is like policy this, policy <laughs> that. And it just feels shallow and empty quite honestly and um it just i'm hoping i mean i know it's important i know it's part of our responsibilities but i just feels like i'm just regurgitating this stuff now that uh it's been uh two two or three years since the code of ethics and the uh, library materials student enrollment so um I'm hoping that we don't have to do this like every single board meeting. Uh, I, I certainly don't expect that. And okay. um, I don't have my entire book in front of me now, but I do think we are soon to a place where we will have gone through all the policies that were on the books when I started. And once that happens, it's going to be my recommendation that the policy committee just go into a three-year cycle of just reviewing against the most recent policies that um, the school boards association has either reviewed or, right. as, as in the case um, Kara Lufkin brought to my attention, there's a, a new policy that's required by the legislature on homeless students. So right. that's that's never been required before. Um, but yes, we should. we're very close to getting to a place where will have gone through all of them. Um, so yes, the answer to your question is yes. All right, good. Okay, um, public relations committee met for the last time this year, this past uh, Wednesday. Tom, do you want to share an update as to what went on during that meeting? Sure, yep, um, yep, so we met on Wednesday and um, uh, just give you a few items that came out of that. Um, one is that we have a new video coming out from the school that is um, something that was done um, in Brian Duff's, um, what is this, Friday After School Video Club as part of, part of the CATCH program, so that's pretty exciting. Um, Brian said this video is, should be complete by the, um, by the last day of school. And so it's a video that um, he said, uh, one, kind of welcomes new families to the school district, and two, showcases some of the capital improvements, um, such as the biomass boiler and the cafeteria, kind of a virtual tour component to it. Um, and uh, Brian, I believe you recently filmed something for that, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, I sure did. Yes, <laughs> I did. So you probably know more about it than I do, but um, this is great. It's something uh, we've been talking about in the PR committee for a while now, and then uh, Brian and Christine Owens, you know, from the Catch program, just kind of ran with it and built a, a, a class around it. Um, and so this will be great. We'll have this, you know, basically like a promotional video for the school. And so hopefully, you know, we'll be able to get that on our school website, um, you know, Facebook page. We talked about, um, you know, like promoting that on Facebook to really reach a lot of people and to kind of target the audience there and get it out to, you know, the, get the link to area realtors and things like that. So it should be a good resource for us uh, PR wise. Um, and then um, 
Also, we are getting some uh, some school swag. Um, we have a thousand dollars in our budget for that. That we um, so we need to use that before you know by June thirtieth, basically. And we talked about it as a group. And um, Lydia is basically kind of finalizing what we're getting, but we're going to basically divide the money between uh, water bottles and um, hats, like baseball hats. Um, and the hats are sort of based on hats that some sixth grade students designed. Uh, this year, and they were pretty popular, and so we thought that would be good. And um, since there's going to be so much activity at the school this summer, we are going to make them available, probably give them, you know, to students. Um, but then we were thinking we could maybe sell them to to help, you know, fund uh, further PR efforts. And then also related to that, um, with school apparel, like our sports apparel, I know Eileen is helping with this, and we're uh, starting discussions with the um, athletic department to maybe have some more athletic apparel offerings, um, you know, sort of like the academy, although they have a lot, uh, not nearly as much as that, but, you know, some some different options for apparel. So there are, you know, more opportunities for people to wear uh, their catamount, you know, pride around town and stuff. So we are working on getting that, you know, going for hopefully for next school year. Um, and a few other things, but that's pretty much um, the main stuff that we've been working on. And that was our last meeting for this school year, so we won't meet again until August. All right. Um, <clears throat> I did want to bring this up in terms of vaccination rates. Uh, we shared this with the leadership team um, and the reopening task force. I think the last number I saw is that we're at 79.2% uh, of Vermonters are vaccinated. And as you no doubt have heard and know, um, once the 80% threshold has been crossed, the state of emergency will no longer exist, which will make all the documents that have been coming to us from the Agency of Education and the Department of Health mere recommendations, and they will have no um, power of law behind them. That being said, given that we have one, two, three, four, five school days left, there will not be enough time to implement any different strategies for these last days of school. We will continue to follow the guidelines, policies, practices, and procedures that we currently have um, through the remainder of this school year. Um, and that is it from my report. I noted the action items that we have, and I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has them. All right, no questions. So if you all don't mind, I'd like to uh, alter the discussion items. Um, I have a few things to say about Zoom, and that will be a nice segue into the math curriculum update. Is that okay if I do that? Of course. Okay, so um, a, a fellow school board member kind of woke me up to my Zoom slumber, and I've been thinking about Zoom, and I've told you all how much I despise it over the course of the past few months. But this is my last Zoom meeting. Uh, I am no longer going to participate with Zoom. Um, I haven't seen uh, my fellow board members in months and months and months. And the only time I ever see Dean is when he's training for his marathon. Um, I'm, we're completely disconnected. I feel completely disconnected from the leadership team. Uh, I've been on boards for 13 years. And I've never felt like so in insignificant as a board member uh, with uh, just living life behind a computer com computer screen. Uh, so uh, I feel that the pandemic is completely under control. Uh, I know it's a matter of opinion, but it's time for us to meet face to face uh, rather than uh, behind these computer screens. And I, I just feel as though that um, we're all just disconnected. And I can only imagine how the students feel if I feel this way and I'm only uh, seeing you all a couple times a month, and they're they're doing this on a daily basis, so uh, I can only imagine. But um, you know, it, it came to a point last board meeting that we have a major curriculum change, and it's reported in the principal's report. And um, obviously, you know, that's jo Jody's job to uh, talk about it. And and you know, as a board, you know, we should be. Uh, included with that, not just as a side note in the principal's report. And I just, 
I feel Zoom is a big part of uh, this disconnection uh, with all this. Uh, so uh, moving forward for our second meeting in June, I, I see a, a few options. One, cancel it. Two, proceed with the meeting without me. Or uh, three, have a live meeting. And I don't know what the, you know, the uh, slow board of education in Vermont is doing with this mask update if we have to deal with this for another uh, another summer or what, uh, or if it's our decision whether to go live or not. But I suppose we should uh, look at to the next board meeting. And also, we, if there isn't one, we should decide where the uh, board retreat is in July now, and if there's any other topics to address. So that's my two cents. If anybody wants to uh, uh, shed their opinion or uh, what they want to do uh, for the second second meeting in June, let me know. I did connect with Jody uh, Oliver. Even if it is a brief Zoom meeting or some meeting, we will need the TAN, the tax anticipation note, and the deficit note approved before July 1. So um, I know the Finance Committee is meeting next Monday, the 14th, to make recommendations on those. Um, so, it, and it, we can we can adjust the meeting schedule if the if the 21st does not work for everybody, um, but we will need a board meeting even if it is just to briefly um, approve those two documents for fiscal year 22. So can we just do a live? I believe we. Can. I mean, my my gut is that by the 21st we will have crossed the threshold. Um, It'll be very brief, but we certainly can. Yeah, it uh, doesn't matter to me, but uh, I'm not doing Zoom, so um, we can we can discuss it uh, over the next uh, week or so, if you would like. I think you do it live, and if there's resistance, we do it outside. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, if we do it live and uh, some board members don't feel comfortable, they can do it by Zoom. We still have Zoom options for the community. It's just... I'm not doing it by Zoom, so I'll be live somewhere. So yeah. I'm good with live. I, I, maybe, maybe Brian, you could reach out to the Agency on Education and see if they'll give us an update on new advice now that we're, you know, for those of us that are immunized at least. So I, I think so. I, I can share what the concern is going to be. It's that as a public meeting, you can't deny people access. So if it is a live meeting, there will have to be some way, at least at this point, by my reading of the guidance, to either verify that the person has been vaccinated and therefore does not need a mask, or if they're unvaccinated, they will have to wear a mask. Um, that, that's the bugaboo at this point. And, and just for folks to know, that's, that's going to be our um, summer school, our summer programming prerogative is anyone who is fully vaccinated and can demonstrate their full vaccination, they do not need to wear a mask. Anyone who is not fully vaccinated will have to wear a mask in the building. And for those people who do not wish to share that information, they will also have to wear a mask. So if we can, if we can, because there will be summer programming happening, um, we will still have students in the building if we can if 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 we can come up with a way to to do that then we can certainly have it live indoors or we can have it live outdoors i mean there are, there is no cap um outdoors at this point so need proof of vaccination that's oh my lord how, they gonna, how long are they going to do that until 2022 2023 when's it going to stop when are we going to lose again uh, that i don't have an answer to yeah. Certainly, if you go into a supermarket, you don't need to provide proof. They're doing it on good faith. Um, um, and those people who aren't vaccinated can wear a mask if they want to. Uh, but the rules are written. I haven't read the rules, so I'm just asking. Are we sure it's written that way and not in the reverse? So the, the way that we are approaching summer is how we just described it to you. I know, but I'm asking for the meetings. Well, so the, again, because the meetings are public access, I, I will clarify, but you know, the meetings are public access. I believe the recommendation from the School Boards Association was to not start live meetings again until July. 
I will reach out to them and, and follow up to clarify what the steps need to be if we're going to have a live meeting in a school space. We need, we need to get those two things passed regardless. But um, Agreed. Really nice to go live, and it would be really nice to do it earlier. And like I said, I, I think we could always provide access to people who are not immunized at least through Zoom, correct? Yes. I mean, it won't be – so it won't be – we haven't really discussed this yet. I, I was planning on bringing this to the um, board retreat. It won't be like this because not everybody who is in attendance will want to be sitting in front of a computer, all of you board members. Um, so I'm looking into some other options that would um, still provide the same amount of access and give people the opportunity to weigh in. Um, but I haven't, I don't have a firm recommendation yet. So I think probably, and again, I can only speak for myself, and I, I believe Eileen and Mark, I believe, is vaccinated. Tom, um, if you, are you comfortable sharing? So we, um, yeah, fully vaccinated. Yeah. yeah, so we've got a quorum of people who are vaccinated. So um, um, from a board standpoint, we can definitely get together because we can all provide proof. Um, um, it's just a matter of how do you provide access to the community at large. And like I said, if it's mandated that we ask them to provide proof, they can either come or they, and wear a mask if they don't have proof, or they can give us proof, and we can provide anyone who doesn't want to share with online opportunities. Well, you there's still a quorum if I don't participate in June. You can just do Zoom one more time, and I know I missed a meeting. I don't think any of us do Zoom any more than... than <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm stubborn that way, so I'm not going to change my mind. Yeah, I know. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but don't we, uh, once the state of emergency is lifted, I believe we have to provide a physical location, don't we, for our meetings? Uh, that's the, the uh, there may be more guidance coming, but the last that we heard was that there should not be any live meetings, again, um, because of the hmm. issue of public access until um, until july and what i understand the one line um that the department of health is planning to say once the state of emergency is lifted is that all fully vaccinated people do not have to wear a mask nor socially distant but all unvaccinated people do need to wear a mask while indoors um and that's that's from louisa had her weekly meeting with um, her regional group, which included Dr. Brina Holmes, um, I want to say last Thursday or Friday. Well, I mean, that's may, what may the I? CDC, oh yeah, go ahead. So there's, I, I'm listening to all of this and I don't see why there couldn't be an in-person option with a remote option. Like I, like I, that's the piece that I'm, I'm missing in this conversation is that it sounds like we're talking about fully only in person or no. fully only on Zoom. And that's, and that we don't need to do that. So isn't that point, like it can just be arranged to have both options? I would say so, yeah. I'm not opposed to doing Zoom at the meeting. I'm not opposed to having a computer with my face on the computer. So anybody who doesn't feel comfortable uh, going to a live meeting, you know, can, can see us on Zoom. I'm just no longer going to be doing it solo by myself, either at work or in the hotel or, or here at my house. Uh, I'm, I'm in hospitality. <laughs> What's hospitality? People. So, yeah. So I, that, Eileen said it better, but that's what I was saying. Yes, definitely. I caught that. So let's plan on an in-person meeting for those of us that are vaccinated unless there's some rule against it and then we're gonna have to figure it out because we do need a meeting because we need to get those things approved preferably before interest rates go up and it costs the taxpayer any more money so then we can do it at the uh meeting center or in the school right or in the school oh we can go into school wow because yeah, that's been in a school in a year yeah. all right so, uh, Brian, you can just circle with, circle up with me. I don't know. They you got it. Or something? I okay. just I just emailed uh, the head of the school boards association to clarify, and um, yeah, we can absolutely figure it out. Okay. All right. So, um, so Jody, uh, you can take it away with the math curriculum. Um, as you probably know, I requested it to be back on the agenda because uh, it's something this important. I think sounds uh, much better coming from you uh, rather than a principal. So, uh, you know, moving forward, when we have like major changes like this, 
uh, don't be bashful about coming to our meetings and talking about it because we definitely want to participate and you know have a uh, have a voice uh, with uh, all of this. So uh, please take it away. All right. Hello, and I apologize because I'm sitting here and my internet is choppy. So we will do the best that we can. And if I cut out, please um, type in the chat or whatever to ask your question again. All right. Um, so I'm going to start. I shared a document with you. You have you got it in the folder. Um, kind of about what the process has been from when I came back to St. Johnsbury in, believe it or not, 2017, seems like yesterday, um, and then what the work was prior to this year, what the work has been that we've been engaged in this year, and then what's going to the plan moving forward. I'm not going to read that document to you, but I will highlight some of those um, pieces as I talk about where we are now. Um, Mark, I appreciate you sent me a couple of questions, um, and that kind of helped me think about what to share. So two questions that uh, Mark asked, and if you have others, please share them. Um, why the switch? And then um, question around assessments and in terms of COVID, um, how the agency of edit is asking us to um, assess where our students are in terms of learning loss and how we're going to do that. So I'm going to address those two major questions, and perhaps I will answer your other uh, questions through this process, all right? But again, feel free to stop me at any time. So why the switch? Um, I will tell you that this switch was actually um, requested back in 2017 when I came back to St. Johnsbury. They were using Eureka when I came back, and we've been and have been using Eureka since it was developed when the Common Core came out in 2012. So it's been around a long time. And what happened when I came back, it was kind of what comes first, the chicken or the egg sort of um, situation in that we had, there was no work around proficiencies happening. And the um, Vermont Ed Quality Standards were very clear about each school district had to have a viable written curriculum. And St. Johnsbury didn't have any of that. And so that's really where we started. Um, we held off on doing anything around programmatic changes because we didn't know what we were really looking for, if that makes sense. Um, so Joy is saying, uh, let us know what the switch is. So Joy, we are switching from Eureka Math to illustrative mathematics. And so that was the reason, um, so we've been talking about this for a while. Um, it's a conversation that began, but we held it off um, with our math leadership team and said, all right, let's really identify what our proficiencies are first, all the way down to our student learning outcomes so that we can really target what instruction is going to look like. And we're at that place now when we're really digging into what's the instruction look like. And so we've been doing that for almost three years now, but in various ways. So I'll talk about that. So that's why the shift. We're at a place where our teachers are requesting a shift because the program we're using is so out of sync. Our instructional practices, what we know is best practice, that it's time for us to make a move. So that's kind of where we, where we kind of made that decision. So in terms of assessment that you asked about, Mark, um, and where the agency of ed is around uh, COVID, what I just want to um, say to everyone is that, yes, while we've been living through a pandemic, and yes, we're supposed to assess, I want to be really clear that COVID, we're not assessing learning loss because of COVID. We are always in a continuous improvement planning cycle. That's what we do. So we're always assessing where our students are. That's not new. What COVID did was actually help shine a greater light on uh, especially the hybrid learning, what was happening with those students. And we saw a greater gap happening with our program and the, the lack of effectiveness with our math program, if that makes sense. And so that really kind of pushed us to say, okay, what's going on? So three years ago, we began um, with a small cohort of teachers um, working with the Agency of Education and All Learners Math Network. And through that process, we're really identifying what are our desired instructional practices? 
what are those high leverage practices that we know will help us dig in into student thinking and reasoning and get an idea of what they really need to know to be successful. So we started that with a small group of teachers three years ago. And this has just been a natural evolution. You heard me say when I've come to the board previously that we have been slowly in the process of scaling up and building capacity. And that this is just the next natural evolution on it. But COVID said to us, we, knew, we need to move faster around our mathematics. And so that's why the switch came so quickly. It, I'm sure it feels quick to you, but for us who have been in the school and doing the work and having the conversation, it doesn't really feel that fast. Um, it just seems feels like the natural next step. May um, I ask so, a question at this point, Jody? Of course you can, please. Um, so you, if, you said that um, when you, Eureka started in 2012, or no. you, you used the word 2012, was that correct? Mm -hmm. And then you said in 2017, this change was when we kind of started talking about initiating it and really looking for it. Well, it's 2021 now, so we're almost at five years again. Um, how has most recent look at best practices and newer curriculum been incorporated into this process? And that's, and that's exactly what's happening. Um, our teachers have been making do with Eureka for the last three years, right? So they've been trying to tweak the tasks that are in Eureka to meet our needs around our proficiencies. So this is, so when I say they've been using it since 2012, they have, but for five years, they weren't really having a conversation around the success of Eureka, right? They weren't talking about how really monitoring closely how our students were doing um, in terms of mathematics. So I'm looking at someone and said, you know, how will the data of the learning gaps? So we don't assess programs, right? We assess the concepts and skills in the proficiencies that are directly from the standards. That's what our local assessment plan does. So the local assessment plan that we have doesn't assess the program itself. It assesses those big concepts in mathematics. And so that's where we put the emphasis. And so when you're asking the question about COVID and how are we going to measure the gaps, we're gonna measure the gaps like we always do through our local assessment plans about what we're assessing in the classroom for high stakes assessments and so and state assessments, the SBAC assessments. That's how we measure student growth, if that makes sense. Um, I'm just quickly trying to read your question, Eileen, okay? Ah, so the question around what is the, why are we choosing this program, Eileen? So we're choosing this program because um, First of all, it's been a topic of conversation around the state of Vermont and in other places, but specifically because we have our two consultants from All Learners, Math All Learners, who um, really have said, you know, based on where we are with our instructional practices, and we're really trying to emphasize less is more mentality. So Eureka actually has, as you've seen, gives you lots of problem sets, we're really honing away from lots of problem sets and really getting to prop, really um, effective problems, a couple, one or two that drives the instruction. And we're gonna ask students to engage in that problem solving piece and really talk about what do you know? What's your thinking and reasoning around solving this problem? And really emphasizing student discourse around mathematical concepts and skills. And so it's not that problem, problem, problem. It's really getting some really good problems that help us unpack where students are. And, and, and using formative assessments in our classrooms to really drive that day-to-day -day instruction on a deeper level. Um, so somebody's asking, will teachers no longer be required to supplement when you move to illustrative mathematics? That is the hope. Um, but I want to go back to why do we choose this? Um, so in conversations for the last 
year and a half with the consultants from All Learners asking, you know, I've been saying, what are the programs out there? What are you hearing? Because they work with schools across the state of Vermont and across New England, and now they're actually going national. And I've been saying, you know, what are the programs out there? What do you know? Because they have certainly more exposure than I have. And from our work with these consultants, it was, what do you think makes the most sense? And back in November, they said, based on where you want to go around high leverage practices and what you want your students doing on a daily basis, this is the program that we believe works will work best for you. And so that's where that came from. I will tell you that our teachers who have been engaged in professional development around mathematics pretty heavily for the last four years, but definitely the last three years, um, they've been hearing around this, hearing about this program out in the courses that they're taking. And so at the last board meeting, when you had two uh, teachers, one from a primary level and one from middle school level, express to you how are they excited they were about the shift that's because this program is really getting high marks in terms of its effectiveness again like any program when we're starting it we're not sure we're, we're taking what the research is saying um and and what we're hearing and that's and we're going to move forward um yeah how long has this program been around so this program at the middle school level has been around for three years. And actually our middle school teachers have been dabbling with it for over a year and a half now, actually two years. Sorry, COVID has really messed with my timetable. Like you, Mark, I'm lost in the, the, the Zoom land. Um, so our teachers have been working for a while. The K through five program, is actually not I don't say new this year because it's been a pilot for two years. So that's where they've been getting their data about its effectiveness. And it's now just being offered at large, beginning of, uh, just opened up the end of May. Can you share that data about the effectiveness? You keep on saying that it's the data says that it's effective. Sure. All you have to go on to is um, the clearinghouse. Uh, what's it called? Something, something clearinghouse. I can look it up and share that. Yeah, it was, that was just so you know that can see more information. Um, yep. And so back in November, um, I had a meeting, a Zoom meeting, with the um, writers of Illustrative Mathematics, and uh, Carol Van Ostrom was with me on that. And they walked us through all of these components about what it has so we could actually see if it was aligning to what our thinking was. Um, and again, that thinking comes not only from the all learners consultants, but also our math leadership team, because these are the types of things we talk about. Um, so somebody's asking, how are you, how are you planning on an implementation slump? Um, I, I don't, I don't really know how to answer that, that to be honest with you. Um, I think they're worried about the lag between when teachers are really comfortable with it and when we can start seeing student success with it. I think that's what they mean. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle it in that direction. And if that's not what you mean, oh, there we go. Uh, so I honestly don't know, um, and it's too early for me to to actually even to to really even hypothesize what that would look like. Um, I think that. You know, because we've been doing the work and building our teachers' um, content knowledge in mathematics across the school, and then um, and thinking about what are those instructional practices that we really want to engage in, this is our next step. Um, because we are working with all learners, and we've been talking about how to tweak a task, um, and that means to take a task out of any program and make sure that it aligns with what we're looking for, make sure it aligns with the content or the skill that we want our students to really grapple with and that we can assess it. And so we're gonna continue that process. Um, next year, we've got some, some um, additional professional development happening with all learners, as well as PD at the beginning of August with illustrative mathematics. Um, to kind of help us hit the ground running. Um, oh, Lydia's chiming in there. 
So I just, you know, sorry, I lost my train of thought as we read the chat. Bad habit. Uh, I really, I'm encouraged. Our teachers are encouraged. Uh, I'm, I, I don't want to apologize. We didn't know about in advance because the natural process and it's been a natural evolution. I do feel saddened that you felt like you, um, it kind of sprung. Up. Um, but this is what we do. Um, this is, again, I, I feel very strongly. We've definitely gone through a process, everything that we do. Um, I, I really work hard to make decisions made in a vacuum. And sometimes that those processes move faster than others, depending on our topic. But this one was, it took time. Because we're really making sure that we had a greater understanding of what were our priorities, how we to assess them, and what is what are those instructional practices that we're really going to highlight to meet our students' needs. I, I'm going to I'm going to um, kind of go off of what Eileen's asking next because it's kind of the same question I had. I'd answer her question and also um, tell us how the teachers are going to be prepared to first week of school coming up because I believe we're jumping right. to this um, this fall, are we not? Yes. And so the team actually already been given access when we start to the first unit, the first module um, back in January, because much of this is already online. The entire sixth grade uh, middle school curriculum is open source education. It's a 100% online. Um, so teachers have access clean the first module and that's how they were able to have informed conversations about with their leadership team um, representatives around what, what do you think based on the conversations we've had around instructional practices and what we're looking for in terms of outcomes for students do you see this being a good fit so teachers already have that number one that one first module as soon as the grant is submitted, which is the CFP, which I am hopefully going to be hitting submit tomorrow afternoon, uh, once that is has been submitted, it is considered substantially approved, which means I have the purchase orders ready to purchase the materials. Um, and, and we're gonna, so teachers will have it. What I'm being told is they should have it by, by the 1st of, August is what I'm being told. Is, is a, but most new course curriculums have some teaching for the teachers, I believe. Correct. And that August. I mean, I think what's what's interesting is that I think there's a yes, there the teachers need professional development, but they're already seeing the, the module and seeing how it's structured. So they're seeing the components, and then we'll talk about what that looks like. You know, you have to remember that in the primary grades, our instruction doesn't really start until after the first weeks of school. So that does give us a time uh, lag that can actually get that professional development happening. So I'm going to talk about the how we're going to support that PD in just a second. But again, the middle school has already been using it. And and um, what are we doing for the first six weeks? Is that just refreshing them as to what they learned the year before? No, we don't refresh what's happening. But we look at what are our high leverage concepts in mathematics and we talk about assessments and we hit the ground running with those assessments that say, okay, what are we seeing? What do we need to look at in terms of uh, bolstering students' understanding around those high leverage concepts so we can move forward? Those first six weeks are our system where it's really about creating those learning communities. So it's not it's not void of content, but it's not heavy content that you would expect to see, you know, within a couple of weeks at the middle school level, for example. So there is a little bit of a time lag there. Um, so in terms of professional development, the all learn um, consultants. Jody, can I say one? Chime in. Okay, I just wanted to add that the degree um, of mathematics, either like currently with the Eureka 
in the Brown Math Menu, which has been supported by the All Learners Network. And our teachers have, right. we have a, a two different groups of teachers being supported by the All Learners Network. And that professional development has been going on for um, two years. So some people are, uh, are just finishing up their second year of professional development. Three years, sorry. Some people are finished, finished up their second year and some people are finishing up their first year. And that professional development looks like um, in the most coaching, like lesson observation, afterward, going professional, like group sessions throughout development. Um, and so they're currently doing that structure of instruction um, with their Eureka that instruction will continue with illustrative mathematics uh, and they pay nicely um, because it's been really hard to pair Eureka with Math Menu, but the illustrative mathematics and Math Menu go really nicely together. So that's not to say that our right. teachers don't need that personal development, don't need that support and implementation, but not less giving complete because the implementation will look very similar to what they're already, they have already done and are already implementing and growing and getting professional feedback from our consultants. What shifts, right. So what's shifting is the program. So we're going to give them that program, programmatic professional, but the ongoing professional development with the consultants from all that we've been engaged in, like Lydia said, for three years, that's just a continuation. What changing here is our scale up. So we've decided um, as a leadership team that next year, all teachers of mathematics will focus on mathematics. So any teacher that teaches mathematics, pre-K through eight, will focus on mathematics. Um, because we're looking at that consistency of practice. And, um, so we'll have all learners here. They will be here two days a month. We'll be doing um, classroom visitations as, as well as, as professional development every month on tweaking tasks and making sure it aligns with our instructional practices. Other questions? Um, Jory, I think Joey Ely had a question that wasn't addressed about the community members. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed that somewhere in the, the line. I apologize. So can you repeat the question? I don't see it. I'm coming back. I'm going to try to pull it. How will this data and the app of learning that you see be shared with families? So, um, I will tell you right now, Joy, what's happening um, in, in the primary grades. We have completed the um, PNOA assessments. And so in those PNOA assessments, we can really gauge where students are now on our high leverage practices and those really um, important concepts and skills. So we can give that information. We've not yet had time because, as you know, COVID and absences, it's really hard to get all of the students assessed. Um, these assessments take about 45 minutes to an hour. They're individual interviews with students. And one, we've assessed uh, students from K2 times a year in mathematics, get a really deep understanding of where they are and talk about their growth over time. In for three through eight, one of the easiest ways that we do it is we talk about um, assessments. We don't have SBACs from last year. But we will have current SBAC just completed them for the most part. We're at like 198% debating on grade levels. Um, and then we upload that just like I showed you two years ago. Um, the data where we uploaded that and then we talked about individual student growth, that exact process will happen over the summer where we can have some direct information on what that looks like right now because of how we're finishing everything up. It's just not available right now. And unfortunately, school is going to end before that is. A Any other questions from board members um, for Jody? 
just have one to follow up on what was just said. Um, so what was that? that we're measuring student outcomes and student success is going to remain consistent. We're going to be using those same measurements that we have in the past. Correct. Okay. Um, what will change a little bit, Eileen, is the formative assessments for the day-to-day -day instructional component so that teachers can determine, you know, once a concept, a skill and a concept has been understood, formative assessment, they'll decide what continues to need to be whole group instruction because students, um, to see it and, and more, what students need extension, and then they'll talk about differentiation in terms of both sides, and that's where the math menu process will really um, come to fruition through that process. So that led to my next question about um, tiered support. So is that kind of going to be that structure for determining tier one, tier two, tier three supports needed in mathematics? Right. right. So we don't call them tiers. Um, the multi-tiered system of support through the agency of education is universal instruction. So when I talk about whole group instruction, that's universal instruction. And anything like where you talked about tier one and tier two, which is like RTI language, that's called layered supports. And layered support can be anything from additional small group differentiation in the classroom, all the way to special needs students who are getting very targeted, specialized instruction with special educators. So the answer is yes. The assessments we use compass um, of the above. Um, but again, it is a process. So this new program allow kids to progress at their rate rather than as a universal group. Because, and I speak, you know, again, I'm a few years out of middle school, but we got bogged down in a couple concepts where we just didn't progress on frack forever. Right, and that's the piece where the math menu and the work with all learners really is has to be emphasized because that's around meeting students' needs where they are, both in remediation or extension. And that's that component that figuring out what are those math practices and concepts that we're really going to emphasize. So part of the tweaking of the tasks for teachers is to really think about are those questions, even during whole group instruction, that extends the problem beyond for those students who are ready to move beyond? I don't see how that's going to work. Um, but I'm not in education. Uh, it seems to me that if you're stuck in fractions for the group, you're stuck in fractions for the group. Well, it depends, Mark. I mean, I mean, excuse me, Dean. How does it depend? Well, you know, are you talking... Are you talking, you know, where are you talking in fractions, right? Are you talking the beginning of fractions? Are you talking addition and subtraction of fractions? Are you talking multiplication and division of fractions? I mean, it, there's a, there's it a doesn't, huge... It doesn't matter there. I mean, once someone has mastered the skills in fractions, they should be able to move on. Um, the question is, is, and again, I don't know math menu, so I don't honestly know what you're talking about when you talk about math menu. But the um, um, if a kiddo is proven his proficiency in fractions what's to keep what's to how he should progress the next set of lessons um, either as a small cohort as or as an individual with this current program so that's what the piece lending and small group instruction we've worked you know it's interesting that in literacy we talk about small group instruction we go to guided reading right Giving students instruction where they are in literacy has been something that we've done for years and years and years, right? We talk about where are they, we talk about what are the needs and how are we going to get there. What we've not done in education is we've not enhanced that understanding of those high level uh, practices instruction. We didn't transfer it to other content areas. And this is where we've, we're transferring it to other areas through the help of all learners talking about what does that GA look like? How do you do that? How do you how are you doing that small group instruction so you're not holding kids back who are ready to move forward? And it could be, as you know, uh, Eileen asked, where does your your supports come in? Well, the we everything we do is 
data informed. So until we have data in front of us that sells, you know, authentically, what do we see? Kidding? And it's not just a one shot window. It is over time. Are they truly proficient? Because you can't say you're proficient if you take one assessment and you have an assessment. You don't say you don't and go, OK, they're proficient. Move on. What, how do we revisit those concepts and skills to ensure that those students truly are proficient? And that is through that small group instruction manual work. And I think it would really be great as we move forward with any of our work, having teachers actually come and do uh, a presentation where the board, you can, they can actually talk about what they've done and you could see it at different grade level shifts in action. Because I think that's the power in the work. Other board questions? Um, if not, um, Joey, why don't you ask me your questions and we'll circle to uh, Andrew's questions after that. Great, thank you. I apologize, I'm not seeing on my thing. So you'll have to actually say them verbally, Joy. Yep, no problem. Thanks. Um, so as a parent of a now eighth grader, um, I'm concerned about switching a curriculum for eighth grade year. As this past seventh grade, she's had multiple math teachers. We haven't had any communication since second quarter um, regarding math, report cards, assessments, anything. Um, and we don't, I feel, I know exactly where my kiddo is, and now she's gonna have a new math teacher who I don't believe is a current teacher at the school. I'm not 100% certain on that. And they're gonna come in in August and they're gonna have to learn a new math curriculum that they haven't been exposed to like all the teachers have. Um, and the only current teacher that's gonna be in her cohort is a science teacher um, that could give guidance. So I'm wondering how this math teacher is going to be brought up to speed, how my daughter is going to be <laughs> caught up. Uh, I, 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 we all know as educators that when you switch a curriculum, it takes a good couple of years. Everybody moved in that direction. Um, my daughter does it. I've had this conversation with Jeremy multiple times around my kids, and it seems like we're taking steps back. Um, I appreciate I, I appreciate being a, a little curriculum and making it stronger. And I like the idea of, of individual um, focus. Um, but I'm concerned about this eighth grade eighth grade class. All right. Well, I'm not going to speak directly to ask Joy and and possibly not your direct questions because I I don't think that's my role. Um, but I will talk about. You mentioned several times the curriculum change. Let me be really clear. This is not a curriculum change. Our curriculums are our agencies and they are common core aligned and those have not changed. What's changing is the program. Yeah. And I, so I get, I get standards. I get curriculum. Yeah. Yep. I get so the next question was so we do have a shift that's happening. Um, our we're going to be using our coaching model um, in a bigger way to hopefully get a bigger impact. And so we are going to be using our academic support team members. They're going to be deployed um, to different grade levels at different times for where, te where they're needed. Um, and they will emphasize exactly this around instruction and how to make those shifts. Um, so this new teacher coming in, we certainly have resources. I mean, right now we have teachers who are teaching the, the current students that you're talking about, who are familiar with this program, who are available side by side teaching beginning of the year with a new teacher. So we're, we are looking at that bigger system of how do we provide those layer ports both to our students and our teachers because we want everyone to feel successful we're really pushing hard to give everyone the tools they need to move our student learning forward i feel right now can I, um we'll can I, can I jump real quick 
I was just going to add, Joy, to your to your point too. I think one of the um, one of the things thinking about some of our new folks that are joining us next year is that uh, I get we were making the change to a to illustrative uh, math was a real draw of our teacher for coming to us. Um, the fact that this was a, a direction that our school was shifting in, like some of our, our other neighboring schools, um, and a program and an approach that is really um, exciting for, for folks who are really focused on teaching math. So um, I know that that those who are joining us as teachers, including um, uh, the new math teacher who will be on grade eight next year, is something, um, you know, obviously a lot of is it's going to have a shift, but it's also one that they're really excited about and and are eager to uh, to to tell and also he said supports here within the building that will be able to to help them. So, do you think that others are going to be better off next year with this new shift? And how will that be communicated to us as parents outside of just report cards? So that. To have this for you at this moment, Joy. I think part of that is because that's not a conversation that I've had with uh, with our math teams at the middle school level or fourth and fifth. And I would guess that um, the same is true for the for our, our primary and other grade levels. Um, you know, that's uh, your, I think to your point, that's an area that we need to get better at, especially as we make this shift to the new math program. Is the support that we're providing for families at home and the communication that we're using. Um, to keep them in the, to keep all you in the, the loop and help you understand uh, where where our students are in their um, learning. Um, and something that as we uh, get all our new folks on board and look at our, our new teams that we'll be able to spend some time really focusing on that. That's an area that we grow in next, next school year. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I'm also curious, have you guys spoken with the Academy at all or LI around vertical teaming this, this program? Is that alignment? I mean, as a parent, again, as an, of an eighth grader and a child who loves math, I'm really concerned of her at an accelerated level. Um, from now, we're on track prior. Um, so I'm just wondering, what does that look like with the Academy? And have you guys had those conversations? So I... I I'm sorry out, Joy, so I did not hear the first part of your question. I did pick up what I, I heard. What is your alignment with LI and the Academy? I think that was your gist. Yeah, I'm asking if you guys have any vertical teaming or, or um, um, collaboration with the high school. So, so we have not this, and part of the issue, obviously, COVID, but I think there's a bigger issue than that. I think the creation is kind of an apple-orange conversation in that we are a public school, and we are held by a certain set of policies and legislation that we are required to follow. And so sometimes it's with what your instruction needs to look like, here's kind of the way we have to do it. So for example, our work all has to be proficiency based, proficiency aligned. And so, you know, I, I think that as long as we're focusing on the same common core standards and we're focusing on the same concepts at levels, that's a level of alignment that we, for right now, do we want to move forward 100%? Because I think we all are in agreement that the St. Johnsbury community, the school students of St. Johnsbury are all of our students. And we don't care if they're pre-K through 12th grade. We want them to success. Um, and we're going to do what we need to do to get that done. We're excited by that. I know, again, we started those conversations, but that that process fell away. And we're looking to energizing those, those teaming positions. Andrew, I think you also had some, yeah. Which is cost and digital instruction. Hi, Andrew. I can't see you, but hi. Um, so the cost um, for this, again, it is grant funded. We are using title funds to pay for both the program and the um, work for both with um, illustrative mathematics when they come to us for two days in August 
and in addition to the cons consultation we have with all learners. And so the program materials that are also available digitally, we are purchasing hard copy teachers because for what we all like a hard copy in front of us, right? Um, that total from K through five is about $10. Um, and I just did that work. So it's just under $9. And then the professional development piece where they're working with us, I want to say $13,000, but it might, no, it is 13, I think it's like 13.5, Andrew, for the professional development for all teachers of mathematics um, pre-K um, through. Answer your question? Uh, it does, thank you very much. Uh, the second question is, um, from a practical standpoint, uh, a kid, to the classroom, uh, you know, is is this is the instructional work and the action with the student going to feel different? Like, is, is is a student parked in front of a computer screen for more time or less time with this program? Less are, time. You know, are they going to are they going to have a, a, a student experience fundamentally different? Um. So I think for me that to hybrid learning or we're talking in class instruction right so when i'm talking direct instruction in class it is not going to be the um, digital learning but if heaven forbid we end up in covid and we have to go to that route we're going to be prepared to go to that route um, for a student it's really not going to feel much different um, in terms of really targeting and getting that problem and, and really being deeply into a problem um, because again, in terms of those high leverage instructional practices, we're really emphasizing student discourse. And so you can't emphasize student discourse if you're only using a computer. It just isn't effective. Kind of like Mark saying, I'm over, over Zoom, Mark, I'm with you 100%. Same thing in a classroom. We really want our students to engage in a learning community, talk about what they know, so that teachers can think about and hear what are misconceptions and be able to make those shifts along the way. So more direct conversation, more um, engagement with one another, that's where we are in terms of our instruction board. Thank you. You're welcome. Jody, this is Joy again. Um, does this mean that IXL will not be utilized um, for students? So Joy, I don't have a, I, I'm not, I'm not um, I'm just curious how it goes along with where the I can program. Analyze. Right. Um, again, IXL is um, it's it's uh, standards derived, so it, it it still is going to follow the same standards, the same concepts. Whether our teachers are going to use it, I don't know, um, and I don't feel like I can make that statement because I've not had any conversations with any of them, and that just doesn't feel right to me. So that's one of those things that we're, as we move forward and reinstitute our math leadership team um, at the beginning of the year, those types of conversations will probably be engaged in joy. That would be great. Will you be able to relay that out to parents as well? Um, just so that way. I have from Perfect. Yep, so people Thanks. know it. Um, I will say that the illustrative mathematics, like everything nowadays, um, program out there have its own digital platform. Uh, it was expensive, um, and I wasn't, and I'm not ready to um, write that check until we work with the program and see really what's there. And hopefully, if it's something that we're leaning towards, we can get a, a pilot in some classrooms for students to experience it moving forward. But it, again, that's just something, that's, and I've not done enough exploration with my leadership team or our uh, math leadership team to make nations moving forward but it, it's a possibility possible down the road how many times can i say possibility in one sentence huh do we have any more questions um so jody um just a few closing remarks uh thank you for attending our board meeting and giving uh and more importantly or of equal importance i should say uh, uh, the chance to ask these robust questions. Um, yes, it did feel abrupt 
um, for a change of curriculum because uh, we don't know uh, that uh, we're not involved in the day-to-day -day activities. So uh, we don't know that for the past couple of years that you've been working towards this. Um, that's where, uh, you know, we like to uh, you know, ask these questions. A board that wants to just sit and nod and smile, we want to be involved with these robust questions. It's uh, whether we agree with them or not, that's, that's irrelevant because uh, it's not our say to say you can't do this, but it's the opportunity to ask challenging questions. And that's what uh, we certainly will be looking forward to participating in moving forward. I, so, I appreciate the opportunity to comment and share information right. and just so, uh, process. So it certainly doesn't fall in Jeremy's job description with uh, these questions uh, uh, when it appears in a principal's report. So that's why uh, we would be here to be able to ask these questions. And it won't be every board meeting, obviously, but uh, we really need that opportunity. Uh, and so does the community. Uh, thank you much. So to action items. Yes, please. So, uh, Erica, I'll put the uh, panel on the floor here and speed through these because I bet you have public comment. So, let's go. Uh, what do you want to do, Kaiwanis Lease, in terms of the motion? Um, yeah, if you could have a motion that the board um, approves the school entering into the lease with the Kiwanis Club as the lease is written in the board packet. All right, I'd like to make a motion uh, for the school district to. Uh, approve the uh, attached lease uh, with the Kiwanis Club. Cool. So moved. Second. 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 Uh, questions uh, from the public? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Good. Next step, Ryan. Do you need me to sign anything or do you just sign it? Uh, you sign it since it's a lease, so I'll have it ready for you if you want to stop by this week. All right. And then I'll get it over to Morris. So my only requirement is for a chain with a class club is up to 40 uh, back and forth. If you can get up to about 60 back and forth, so that would be All right. Well played. <laughs> well played. Uh, first meeting, reading of policies. All right. Make a motion to rescind the code of ethics policy. So moved. Second. Second. Question, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to the employment of relatives from a policy to a procedure. So moved. Second. Second. Questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. I'd like to make a motion to adopt a policy of employee unlawful harassment. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. I'd like to make a motion to uh, move the great advancement policy to a procedure. So moved. Second. Second. Question, comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 I could make a motion to the homework policy to a procedure. So moved. All right, give me a second. Second. Don't, don't delay here. <laughs> Question? Uh, Come on, we're going to make this enjoyable on Zoom, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, a tennis is enjoyable. Yeah. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to take the policy of collecting library materials from a policy to a procedure. So moved. Second. Okay, can... uh, okay. Questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the student alcohol and drugs as a policy. Moved. Second. 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 Questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to rescind the student. 
So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Oh, I'm sorry, question. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Uh, I can make a motion to up as a policy student attendance. So moved. Second. <laughs> Questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We almost had mm -hmm. harmony there. Uh, and uh, like to make them to uh, the student freedom of expression as a policy. So moved. Second. Second. Questions, comments, public? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, uh, not to rush this last uh, action item. Uh, like a motion to accept the resignation of Donna Cahoon from the St. Johnsbury School District uh, with appreciation for your service and with a regret. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Wonderful. And now it is time for public comment. Is there a public comment? So um, this is Joy. Um, I have other things. Um, so reigniting the um, education team. Uh, it's great that you brought that up, Brian. I was actually talking with a community member that's on the team today about that and wondering where we were at. So if you can take out sooner and later, I know you have our commitment to make it work, um, but we just need them sooner than later um, would be really helpful because I do know that there are some vacation um, planned um, for that as well. Um, so that's clear. Um, I was also on a call today to the Welcome Center is reopened for public meetings. So if you can't have it, the school board meetings at the school, the Welcome Center should be an option. I just wanted to throw that out there to you because we are starting to have meetings um, there. And also my building's always an option for you guys um, too. Um, and then um, I wanted to speak on behalf of several of the parents that are on this call um, or Zoom with you guys. Um, we had reached out at the beginning of the sports season for baseball and softball around what the plans were for baseball and softball for the students in our area. And it came to our um, unfortunate reality or goodness that the school had decided to end the baseball and softball program. Uh, and um, that really wasn't commuted to parents or students. The students were under the impression that there wasn't a coach um and so erica and she can speak as well put out a petition to parents or a google doc to parents and i believe she forwarded it all to you guys around the baseball and softball season and i think we know the importance of athletics and nurturing the whole child and and, and especially during a year of covid when um getting kids out and connected and socializing through sports is so important um i'm hopeful you're all hopeful that um this won't be a misstep for any sport um, upcoming. Parents and kids can get pulled and we can pull kids from our community that are homeschooled, that are, you know, at private schools, um, that are at schools that are smaller to be able to build teams. Um, we see the, the baseball and softball currently flourishing. Um, and I know, like Erica had stated, um, that working the St. Jay Baseball program or the league um, it's always the school sports first until they come to an end of the season. Um, so we're really hopeful, um, encouraging the school and the school board to advocate on behalf of kids and athletics. I know being on the, um, the other committee that I was just on for engaging parents, um, compact committee. Um, that was one of the things that I discussed too, was around sports and sports build communities, sports build family connection and engagement, um, and just really looking at strengthening our sports at the, the St. J school. And if that is parents coming together, community leaders and talking about that and how to strengthen that, I know you have a 
huge crew of, of parents that would be more than willing to their time and help support um, that that initiative to strengthen the sports um, at the school. Thanks. Erica, if I missed anything, feel free. Joy, I just replied to Erica's email, and um, I think you are on it as well. We 100% uh, support, uh, you know, taking the taking our finger off the pause button of our, our softball and baseball teams. I, I, I'm sorry that there was the impression that it was a, a just an ending of that program permanently. It was simply the case for the last few years. We just haven't had enough uh, students who are interested to build a, a, a team. So. Um, it was a hard decision in a few years ago when um, the athletic directors and I were in a position where we needed to make the decision and, and um, their kids. If there are enough students who want to play baseball and softball, we are 100% committed to uh, to putting that program back in place. And, um, you know, there's a thing really that's preventing us from doing that. I know there's coaches who are interested. If there's enough kids to be on the field and, and play, then we are all in. I think that... Um, uh, as I said, you know, you, I, I uh, will connect with Ashley and, and uh, or Ashley White Hill, Bill Fitzgerald, and we'll talk about what next steps need to look like for next school year. But um, I 100% uh, agree with, with all you just said. It, uh, you know, we are, um, you know, excited by the opportunity to be able to, to provide those programs for our kids. And the more uh, activities that we can uh, have them involved in, in and outside of our school day is, is really important. So. Um, but let me uh, have some time to, to check in with Bill and Ashley, and we'll think about whatever the next steps need to look like. Um, I mentioned in my email, I'll make sure I keep you all in the loop because of your advocacy for this. Reach out to, to other families along the way to make sure that we are ready to hit the ground running next school year for uh, baseball and softball. Would it be worth putting out a poll? Just I was going to say, I think the frustration as a parent is from the fact that, I mean, I took five minutes to put together that Google Doc and I sent it out via Facebook and it reached a number of families and we got 42 responses, all of which were in favor of having the program and like 76% of the people responding had children at the St. John's Bay School. It was like, as a parent, we were kind of left in the dark as the ending or the pause, as Jeremy says, of the program. And my daughter is very much looking forward to playing for the school this year. And the fact that, you know, some local area schools that are much smaller in capacity um, are willing and able to field a team and actually want my daughter to play for their school. It's just frustrating as a parent to not, I just felt like that decision was made without any, um, Nobody reached out to the kids who would be willing to play, who wanted to play, who was interested in the program. It just was cut. And I think that was my question too, Erica, around um, how it was determined that there weren't enough players interested in, in playing um, as well. And I don't know if you need parent involvement to be able to get a response like Erica did or how we can help support getting that information um, regarding sports, we're more than happy to be able to help out with that. And I think a lot of, oh, go ahead, sorry. No, I was gonna say, I mean, I, I'm happy to continue to have this conversation, but I think that we're at a point where, you know, I, I hope that you're hearing me say, we'll move forward with this, right? I mean, there's not, I don't feel like we, we I don't feel like we need to um, uh, gather more information necessarily. It's just, if, if I, I agree with you, I agree with what you just said, Erica. I think that we missed, we, our misstep this year was not to connect with, with families and students around who was interested. Um, the years prior to this, when we had uh, decided to push pause in the program, the athletic directors had connected with students. It may not have gone home to families, but it went home to student or went out to students during the school day here to see who was interested. And there was such a small, small level of interest that there wasn't gonna be enough students to be able to, to field a complete team for either sport. So, um, but again, uh, look, I mean, we we support this. We want to make sure we can move forward with it. It sounds like we have the student interest. Um, we'll take the steps that we need to take to make sure that we have all the information that we need and are able to put the put those both those teams back out uh, next school year. Um, and if certainly if something changes, we will do a better job of communicating and being um, you know upfront with everybody around around that piece. I will I will certainly acknowledge that the, the, the decision to um, around baseball and softball sort of fell within my first year in this role. So um, a learning curve on my part and we'll, we'll do better next time around. 
let me just throw this out there too, just because as someone whose kit has grown a bit, um, some of that equipment is pretty expensive, Jeremy. Um, if the parents or the school want to work together to kind of put together a pool of used equipment for people who can't afford it, I bet you I can <laughs> provide enough clothing for three or four kids alone, you know, so including gloves and, and shoes. So it's, it's, um, yeah. 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 So, uh, yeah, just to add to that, absolutely. Like we have a whole bin of stuff. I think all the parents that want the program to happen would be more than willing to help out with that. So don't let equipment stand in your way. Um, one thing I was going to bring up, just as someone who's coached in youth sports in St. Johnsbury for, you know, uh, many years now, I'm I'm really concerned there's a, a real lack of girls um, in St. Johnsbury uh, for all sports. And I don't know what is going on exactly, but I don't, if there's any way we can just maybe try to encourage girls to, to play more. And I don't know if it's just a disproportionate number of boys to girls, but it's just, we've barely been able to field um, youth soccer teams in St. J rec at the three, four and five, six level. And, you know, uh, conversely, there's fewer girls, you know, playing for the school team. I, it's just really concerning. I see the numbers just dropping and I'm, you know, it's not a good thing. And I'm just don't really understand why it's happening, but um, you know, anything I could do to, to help, promote girls sports or anything we could do as a school i just think would really go a long way maybe to getting some of these girls to participate more i think you know just to chime into that tom i think as a uh, girl dad uh there are a lot of opportunities for girls right so we have girls who are doing gymnastics and lacrosse and, yeah. and a lot of other athletic activities and yeah. so the pool you know the pool for each individual sport or activity uh is is, is impacted by that and i think yeah. you no know, i agree i think the more that we can encourage encourage um, both our boys and our girls to participate in, in, in athletics is, is really important. Um, but we, we just also have to, we also know that, um, you know, we're, we're also one of multiple activities that kids have the opportunity for. And, you know, when I was in school, you played three sports. You had to play soccer in the fall, basketball in the winter, and baseball in the spring. And, and our, our, our kids in 2021 are really lucky because they have the opportunity to participate in a lot of different activities. And yeah. so, um, they just it's it's spread thinner and they're put in a position where they have to make some decisions about what what they want to do and mm -hmm. you know our, our middle schoolers especially again speaking from my own child's perspective that's a good opportunity for them to try to start trying some different things mm -hmm. and making some decisions on their own and um Hi. they don't always make the same decision we want them to maybe as parents but it's a chance for them to to give that a shot you know jeremy too i'd swing it back around and, and maybe this is where that group might be beneficial of pulling parents in. I'd look at the converse side of families who can't afford to do rec, who can't afford to pay the hundred dollars to play little league or Babe Ruth too. Right. And then equipment on top of that as well. And the school sports supplement, you know, allows kids to be able to do that. And so, um, you know, really maybe, maybe the school is a great jumping off point to be able to really talk with families to find out what that, what that stopgap is, what, what is preventing kids from playing? Is it travel? Is it the inability to, you know, get to sporting events through the rec program? Is it equipment? What exactly might that be? And then how can we utilize community partners to be able to support families to ensure that kids are getting outside and they're getting physical and they're, and they're getting those pieces because we all know, right, being active and physical decreases behavioral incidences and increases learning and blah, 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 blah. Anyways. So um, I guess I just put that plug out there again of getting the information. Hi, Joy. Am I still on mute? Hi, Lisa. Hi, Joy. Um, I'm actually taking a course in um, positive use development in sport right now. And it spoke to what you were exactly saying, that um, the number one issue um, for involvement in sports has to do with economic insecurity. And that children actually... <laughs> Um, leave the sport sooner and they start the sport later due to economic difficulties. Um, and um, so I think you, you really touched on a, on a positive point there on how, what resources we have in the community that can, can help these families to encourage more um, involvement at an earlier age. And I would just, again, double up, triple up, support that, right? Like, I think that this isn't necessarily 
a school issue, but um, a community issue of sharing information about scholarships that are available and being more visible and intentional about our carpooling and all of that, right? Because it's all happening. It's just not necessarily known to everybody that these things are um, available. Yeah, it's the transportation. It's being able to uh, get that pair of cleats that everybody else has. It's it's all the social determinants that are affecting these children. And if there's one thing that, yeah, and if there's one thing that I have seen come out of COVID is that our community partners that meet um, biweekly are like all about getting problems solved. And so even if this was brought to that committee and being able to be talked about it and how we can support the school and really getting kids involved and what are those barriers and how do we address them and what financial, you know, components can we raise? Um, I know that they'd be all over that too. Awesome. One of my, uh, oh, I don't know how to call it, but uh, at Rivendell, uh, when my father was around, um, sports were uh, an important concept um, with our family. And uh, he had a long standing. Uh, request with the whole school that if there's any issue with equipment, um, funds, anything that has to do with that aspect uh, within our community, um, just let the, let the school board know or just private message me, whatever. It's, that's, it's not an issue. Um, that's uh, one of the commitments that uh, my wife and I share with the community. Uh, so. There's, there's no economic issues uh, in terms of equipment or anything like that. So um, that, that is out there and I just need to be aware of it. Mark, that's awesome. Thank you. Also have the component of making sure that people feel comfortable in assessing um, their needs and willingness to come forward. Uh, whether it tra be transportation or equipment, that also needs to be evaluated, not just Mark's generosity. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, is there any more discussion or public comment? All right. Well, this was an encouraging board meeting. Uh, not that they would ever continue like this, always on Zoom, uh, because the next meeting, I expect to see people live. And certainly in two days, I will see most of the administration live at the sixth, uh, eighth grade graduation, which is the last time I was on campus one year ago during the uh, 90 degree scorcher uh, celebration of the eighth graders. And I hope it's 100 degrees and I melt because I am with people. So. Hey, Mark, can I say one more quick thing? I'm sorry. Yeah, um, sure. Um, I didn't know. I really am gr really appreciative to see the parents that have come out tonight to get onto the school board and, and meeting and talk um, or be part and listen. But I'm also wondering, is there a way that the school board Zoom links or agendas or things like that could be put out um, to the community in a different way than just on the website? Um, it took me, I was able to find it because I'm a repeat um, to you guys, and I was able to get it out to families, but it was really difficult for families to try to navigate the district's website and find it in the Google Docs. Um, so I don't know if it can go up on Facebook the day before or a couple days before, give parents a, a, a heads up about it. And then um, the other point that I wanted to say is um, if we can keep the Zoom link going, even when live starts back up, um, just because some parents, like there are times I got out right before this meeting, so at least I was able to hop on um, the Zoom, and I don't know if I would have made a live meeting. So having the opportunity to do both would be phenomenal. Well, yeah, well, let me clarify so I'm crystal clear as Eileen had the question and Dean referred to it. I'm not saying we're not doing Zoom. I'm just saying that I will not participate yes. in my house privately via Zoom. Perfect. Public meetings, live, we will always have a Zoom option, and that will probably continue for a very long time. But... Uh, yeah, there, there will always be a secondary option. And your other question uh, about uh, the the uh, locating Zoom information, I think Peter had that question actually um, with myself and Brian about two a month and a half ago, and I completely lost track of the question. But Brian, if I'm correct, he had that same question, didn't he? Yeah, and I've been I 
totally spaced when we started the meeting. I've been good about putting it since Peter mentioned it on Facebook, and I totally spaced on doing that today. So it's since Peter had mentioned it, it had been up on Facebook, and um, I will remember to do it again in the future. Perfect. Yep. Great. Uh, so on that end, I will bring the snacks at our next meeting, and I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. So moved. A second? Second. Questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Stay cool, y'all. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.